everyone. Welcome to the Empower Series Online. My name is Clifton Johnson. I'm the founder of the Empower Series Incorporated. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization brought to you by the generous donations of Comerica Bank, AE Media Group, and you. So thank you. If you want to find out more about the Empower Series, check out our website at www.empowerseries.com. You're on YouTube now, so check out all of our previous programs. Remember to like, share, and comment. Do not keep us a secret. Our topic today is going to be on credit, and our speaker is going to be from Comerica Bank. Comerica Bank has a program called Credit Sense, and we're going to talk about different ways that you can get out of this mountain of debt that you're in and to financially thrive. Our guest is Brandon Jones. He's the external affairs manager for the Texas market, but he's been doing this for a long time. He has a passion towards making sure that the community is very well informed and is tapping into the resources that are available to help you be successful and to thrive. So Brandon, welcome to the Empower Series Online. Thank you so much, Clifton, for having me here today. I'm really happy to be here with you. Well, you know, our relationship goes back because you were the, you're in a different role now with the company, but you actually helped the Empower Series open up its bank account at Comerica Bank. Yes, uh, my, my, at that time, Irv wasn't my boss, but he kind of came downstairs and I used to work in the banking center and he said, hey, Brandon, I need you to take care of these people. They're my, one of my favorite nonprofit partners and I need for you to open their account. And that kind of, you know, started our relationship and look where we are now, man. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just say this, it started way back before 2017. Definitely. Because in the series, we've been doing this since 2011. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, you know, who's counting the years, right? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, we've been there with you all since, I mean, it's been what, 10 years now? And we've been there with you since the inception of this. And man, Clifton, I have to say, we are very proud of the thousands of individuals that you've impacted through the Empire Series and the amount of information that you've gotten out to people, just really the quality of your program. Uh, we are just very proud of you and you've come a very long way. So congratulations. Well, thank you, man. I think it's definitely a partnership. Uh, one of our speakers, Dr. George Frazier says, nothing of significance can ever be done alone. Definitely. And so it's definitely not just me. It's partners like you, other community partners, and individuals who are watching today. It's all of us collectively as the Empowers, are the Empower Series. So, um, and then also, you guys have a lot of programs. You do a lot of stuff in the community. So tell, uh, tell me a little bit or tell us a little bit about what Comerica is doing to really help people and businesses succeed in the communities that you guys serve in. Definitely. So we offer a wide array of financial education programs through what we call our Money Sense program. Um, and so, for example, we have business sense, church sense, senior sense, credit sense, everything sense, sports sense was just recently um, set up out in California. And, um, and I would love to report that in 2020 alone, we were able to serve 35,000 people through our uh, money sense program. So we're very proud of that. Um, another great program that we've kind of enacted in 2020 to combat the crippling effects of COVID-19 on small businesses have been our small business boot camps, And this is a national initiative where we leverage the partnerships with community organizations to educate business owners on how to thrive in the face of adversity. And with that, I'm proud to report that we've sponsored over 120 boot camps nationally, and we've impacted over 1,500 small business owners. And so that's just a small tip of the iceberg of kind of what we do in terms of our programming, but we're really proud to support the communities in which we do business with here at Comerica. And um, it really brings us so much joy to, to see people financially succeed or to be financially successful. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things as we get going on this to talk about credit, if, if people wanna get access to you or the resources and the other partners that you guys work with to really help people succeed and businesses succeed. How do they get in touch with you? Yeah, so you can shoot me an email. My email address is bqjones at comerica.com. Um, and no matter where your market, we have a Brandon. So I'm here for Texas, but we have market managers in Florida, in Michigan, in Arizona, and in California where we do work nationally. And so we're able to connect you with kind of the um, services that we provide or with partners who provide really great services. And I think that's where really where the magic is, is working with our partners to impact our communities. 
Yeah, well, what we're going to talk about, thank you on that, Brandon. But what we're going to talk about today is really where people are hurting with COVID-19, people losing their jobs, yes. um, not having the income to really pay their normal living expenses, but not just that, but also their debt payments or getting into debt and just not knowing how they're going to get out of it. So, so I think this topic is so appropriate, given that hopefully we're, we're through with 2020, with the new stimulus package that has been uh, signed is really going to help a lot of people out there who are hurting, along with this program, tapping them into resources that can assist them in recovering, as well as just ed educating them. So without any further ado, let's just, let's just get started. So we're gonna talk about six steps of how you can um, live debt-free and thrive financially. And there's six steps. So we're gonna talk about each one of them, but let me just run through all six steps. The first one is that you can do this. No matter where your situation is, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So we're gonna talk about how you can do this. The key is budgeting and tracking where your money's going and being mindful about that. Then mapping your situation and seeing exactly how much debt you're in and then attacking it knowing your credit score and your credit report, knowing your options and tapping into the resources that are around to help you. So with step number one, you can do this. And Brandon and I were talking previously about, we've all been in situations where our income got cut short. Or we just got a little bit, our bills just got a little bit higher than our income for some reason or another. I don't know how it happened, but Brandon, you were telling me about a situation you've been through personally. So why don't you share that with everybody so that let them know that we're all in the same boat together. Yeah, we definitely are. Um, you know, this was, oh man, almost 10 years ago before I moved to Dallas and, you know, uh, kind of not really fresh out of college, but got a job out of college. And of course that student loan debt is right on your back, <laughs> right? And it's right there ready to be paid and uh, didn't land a job that essentially where I made enough money to pay off the debt, right? And so I found myself in this situation where I was working at a job and it wasn't paying enough, but I definitely had enough bills, right? And so I had to say to myself, all right, man, like you have to do something different. You're going to have to make a change. Um, and so I chose to increase my income, all right? So I uh, literally picked up, moved from Houston, Texas, and came here to Dallas um, in search of a, a, a better life and a, and a more, um, in search of a better career path should I say, um, and that's actually when I landed with Comerica Bank. And you got through it too, right? Yeah, definitely got through the situation just by number one, understanding uh, that a, a lot of people go through this. This wasn't just a, a singular situation where it was just me. I had to understand that people, all people go through hard times and there is light at the end of the tunnel as long as you seek the end of the tunnel. Yeah, well, I, I have a, a similar story to where um, I would say around, was it just over 10 years ago or maybe 20 years? No, 20 years ago. <clears throat> now I'm dating myself, right? <laughs> but I found myself in a situation where my income went from six figures to under $25,000 a year. Wow. And I you know, had to go into my savings, but then after a while I had to you know, start getting into debt and it just got out of control. And yeah. even 10 years ago, I went through a situation where I just couldn't pay all of my bills. And mm -hmm. I had to really seek some of the help. I, de I needed to seek help from some of the resources that I wanna share with you on this show today. But Thank I feel like you. the first step is to really know that no matter how dire your situation is, you can get through this. Yeah. And, and there's certain- darkest things right before right. dawn. Say what now? It's always darkest right before dawn. <laughs> yeah, man. And I will tell you that there's six things that I found even during the during the this time where you where you might feel like there's not a light in the tunnel for you. There are six things that I found that really helped. And so the first thing I would say is always save, because when you're getting into debt, when you're in debt and you feel like you can't pay all of your bills, you feel like you don't have enough to save. But really saving is part of, the, is part of the, the key to not getting back into debt. Yeah, definitely. And it's also the key of, kind of not getting into debt in the first place, right? Um, we find ourselves in debt situations because we need, to, we need to, of course, because we need to borrow some, some sort of money from somewhere, right? And so if you have that savings there, it is a safety net, right? For you to tap into and not have to go out and borrow 
Um, but if you find yourself where you're in a situation where you're already in debt, uh, still save, right? And, and that'll prevent you from going further into debt. Yeah, and so some of the stuff we're gonna talk about is gonna be, yeah, that's easier said than done, but how do you do it? Exactly. So I would just say, stick with us. We're gonna to get to strategies of how you do it. But yes. I would say the six things, number one is somehow make a way of continuing to save as you work your way out of debt. That's number one. Number two would be find a financial advisor. And most people think that financial advisors are for people who already have money, or I don't wanna meet with a financial advisor because all I need to do is get out of debt and save up money. Yes. And when I'm able to invest, I'll meet with a financial advisor. I say you need to build the relationship and meet with them now and to help because they've probably have seen thousands of people who are in your situation Definitely. and add some value to help you get out of debt. What do you tell people about that? Yeah, over the years, my biggest, every time we go out and do financial education, I always tell people, build a relationship with your banker. Go down to the bank and you shouldn't just go there when there's a situation. Go there when there's nothing going on, right? Just to kind of figure out who your banker is. But we have tools and resources to help people out of every situation. And if you are with a very good financial advisor, a very good banker, that banker is there to grow you, right? Uh, we don't just, you know, accept fully grown customers who are credit worthy. No, we actually work with customers to bring them from point A to point B every day. So come in with your authentic situation, your authentic self and whatever that is, right? And, and let us help you. And I would say if you're working with a financial professional and they're looking at you saying that, okay, you're not making enough money for my time, then you don't want to work with them. Exactly. You, really you want don't to, want to work with that person. No. You build a relationship with someone who is there to help you. And then over time, when you are really back on your feet, then you've got that trusting relationship because that person spent time with you and helped you get out of it when there really wasn't any financial gain for that person. Exactly. Yes. And that is the measure of a very good bank. Yeah. And so the other thing is when people are in a lot of debt, they feel like they want to cut up their credit cards and put them away. And for some people who don't have the discipline and control, that might be the right answer. But I would say if you have a credit card that does not have a balance on it. You can still use that credit if you use it wisely. Yeah, it's about using credit wisely. It's about um, leveraging those more established uh, lines of credit. You don't want to. And we'll talk about this, I believe, a little bit more in length. But you don't want to uh, close those um, more mature lines of credit, right? Because they weigh more heavily on your credit report. You definitely want to um, make sure that you're spending wisely with those more established lines of credit um, and leave them open. Don't just cut them up and, and close down the accounts because you're in debt. Yeah. And, and there might be some cards that you are not able to charge on anymore because you're either on a payment plan or they've closed your credit. But if you have some good lines that are already open, what we mean by using credit wisely is do not charge more than what you can pay off at the end of the month. So exactly. Do don't charge more. Yeah, don't charge more than you can pay off at the end of the month. I think a good rule of thumb is don't even charge more than 50% of your line, right? Because uh, okay. credit utilization is very much so a, a, a component of uh, credit, um, your credit score. And so don't use more than half of the line of credit. Yeah, and then the other parts, the other three steps that I found are very critical is that insurance is important. A lot of times people who are not in a situation where they can pay all of their bills, they drop their insurance. That's one of the first things they, they drop. But insurance is really there to ensure that you don't get into a worse financial situation when something breaks down like your car and you can't yeah. get it. Because I can guarantee you, as soon as you drop that insurance, you're going to go out there and get into an accident and be 100% liable for that financial situation where you could have just, you know, coughed up the $100 a month for the car insurance and, you know, and been fully covered. Uh, but I, I can almost guarantee you that it's something bad is going to happen when you are not fully insured. Correct. Yeah. And then also curbing your impulse buying. So whether you, you know, limit the amount of money you take out with you or definitely don't carry credit cards with you. But that's the one thing that's very important to really make sure that you're mindful of impulse buying and curb that. Yeah, and you and you need to, we, we need to examine kind of the emotions behind the impulse buying. Like, why are we buying these things? Is it to impress people? Does it make you feel good? You know, and I think that once we begin to identify the emotions behind the spending, then we're able to kind of uh, take a better handle on our spending. 
Um, so tap into those emotions of like, why am I going down here to Target and, and spending $300 for no reason? Uh, you know, I never had to do it for myself and I still do it, right? Uh, sometimes it's just to relieve stress. I like to go and, and, and spend some money and buy some new trinket or something like that. But I, I have to understand that, hey, the brand in this is tied to emotion. This is not a very practical way to, you know, spend your money. And for me, it's eating out, you know, so it's yeah. not preparing my meals to, before I go to work. It's like just running out there and then figuring out, oh, man, I'm hungry. I got to go get something to eat. So, so that's my impulse buying. So there's, there's six steps. The first one we talked about is always find a way of saving money, even if you're tight on bills. You want to find a financial advisor. That's important to find a financial advisor. Use your credit, credit wisely by not charging more than what you can pay off. Don't stop your insurance because insurance is there to really protect you and make sure you don't find yourself in a worse situation by not being able to get your car replaced or something significantly, take, if something fails and then all of a sudden you can't take care of it because you don't have the money to get it fixed and you stop exactly. your insurance. Uh, curbing your impulse buying. And then the sixth one is really the cornerstone that's going to tie us into step number two is budgeting. I call it the B word. <laughs> <laughs> But I will tell you, everybody has a different way of method of budgeting. Uh, yes. There's a system called 50, 30, 20, which says that if 50% of your net take home pay is used for your primary living expenses, like your housing, housing, utilities, things of that nature, then 30% should be used on discretionary spending, things that you really don't have to spend money on, or they may vary based on your usage. And then 20% can be used on saving and paying down your debt. And so we'll talk about that, but everybody has a different you know, there's a different pot or different top for every pot. That's how it works, right? Exactly, yes. And so our second step is really monitoring where your money goes. And this is where, um, Brandon, what do you use to manage where your money goes now? So I have a, I use an old school Excel spreadsheet budget. Um, and this was a budget that was given to me uh, by my older brother during that time period I kind of talked about before where I was finding myself um, you know, not being as financially savvy as I should be. And uh, my brother kind of sent me this, this budget and I've used it for years. Um, and it tracks every single um, credit line that I have, every single utility bill that I have and all of my income coming in. And I, I literally um, kind of recalibrated or calibrated um, on a, every bi on a biweekly basis. Mm -hmm. So I use I I use the system. I've been using the system since nineteen, what in the at least the nineties, probably back as back as the eighties. Well, I started with an Excel worksheet. No, I started with an Excel worksheet in yeah. in nineteen eighty three when I st started working, right? But then in the nineties, I started uh, using a system called Microsoft Money, which is no longer available, and I know that because my PC crashed last week. And I had to reinstall the software, and the software was free down a uh, free downloadable software. They uh -huh. stopped providing that, and so it's I'm gone. like, "What am I going to do, man? Change?" So now I, I had to buy um, Quicken. Yes. So now I'm using Quicken, but but it goes back to the old fashioned, either written writing by hand, you know, where your money's coming from, going in and going out, or mm -hmm. you use an Excel worksheet, right? I do. So so why don't you? We're gonna step through your process real quick. So we're going to do it in sections. We got your income, your expenses, and then how you compare your expenses to your income. So, so break down your, how do you categorize your income? Yeah. So my income, um, I break it down by the amount and then frequency. Um, so the amount, whatever it's coming in for that pay period and what the frequency is. Um, so whether it's bi-weekly, monthly pay period, um, and then I have an amount for a budget period. So I look at a full month budget period um, because a full month encompasses kind of all of my expenses that are due, right? Um, everything has a due date within a 30 day period. Um, so I choose the budget um, on a monthly basis. Um, kind of the second session I go into is the expenses section. Um, and it kind of, for me, starts off with all loan obligations. And so, you know, at the top of it, of course, is going to be the mortgage, right? You got to pay for a place to live. Um, and then there I go into kind of my revolving lines of credit, um, store lines of credit, um, and uh, student loan payments as well. 
very important loan obligations. Um, from there, underneath it, um, I pay myself. So I know that some people say pay yourself at the top. Either way, it's 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 one of the top line items. Um, and, so for, <laughs> and so for my save for my for my savings. I actually have it as an emergency fund. I don't, I, I, my goal is to have a very cushiony emergency fund. And like I've spoken to earlier, you know, I've been in the situation where something happened and you, I didn't have any money, right? And that is um, a situation I don't want to find myself in anymore. And so I literally have, a, instead of um, like a bill due date in that section, I have it as a goal, a goal amount of how much I want to have in my emergency savings, um, the amount that I want to add to savings, and the frequency that I'm going to add it. Um, and then thereafter, I have all of my other expenses. And those are going to be uh, utilities, you know, gas bill, groceries, um, things you don't think about, right? I, the one thing I wasn't thinking about and I had to add in here was my barber bill. Uh, that's a, a huge thing for me. And I just I wasn't adding it for some reason. I was kind of budgeting one day and saying to myself, why am I coming up short? It was that barber. Um, and so I had to add him in here as well. Those of uh, kind of little bitty things, add everything in here, Netflix bills, HBO, all of those, all of your entertainment types of bills, I have those under here as miscellaneous expenses. And then what the Excel spreadsheet kind of does by itself, it, it will add up all of my um, income, from the top of the spreadsheet, it'll minus or subtract um, the expenses, and then it'll give me a, um, a, an income minus expenses. And uh, it's always the goal that that number is green um, because that means that I've not overspent anywhere. So do you put in a number, like for example, uh, we're, we're halfway through this month. So do you, before let's say April starts, do you already have a budget number in this format of your money that you, that you plan on coming, that plans on coming in in April, where you plan on spending it to make sure that it already balances and you're in the green? Yeah, so I, because I'm a salary employee, right? So all of our pay checks are the same. However, it may be a little bit of a different exercise if you are a commission-based type of employee. Um, and there is a, a spreadsheet or a way to budget for that as well. Okay. So I know that um, there's all these different worksheets. So you can go to the internet and find worksheets. You can, th what's important is not um, how you do it, it's that you do it. <laughs> that you actually do it. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And so I, I do a couple of things. Number one is you want to make sure before the month starts, you've already laid out where your money wants to go. You don't exactly. want to do it like in flow. And, and to your point, if your salary is pretty easy, but if your commission, your income may go up and down, but your bills don't. So it's still important to have a goal of, of how much income do you anticipate making and be very conservative with that and then plan out, okay, if you make this much income, where will it be? Realizing that it may be more, but it also may be less. And then when you're tracking it, how do you, do you update your, your, your worksheet daily or how often do you update your worksheet about where your money goes yeah so i've, I've actually made it a habit I, I literally updated every pay period so um on the pay period whatever that friday morning is i literally sit down with coffee and i do my own work first and this is my work um so i literally sit down and pay every bill that's due in that pay period um on that friday morning and it's it's that's what it's about it's really about developing those healthy habits of making sure that you're staying on track financially, right? Because it can easily get off the rails um, and you don't, you don't want it to do that. So for me, it's a bi-weekly process. So explain something to me. What happens when you don't have enough income to pay your bills? Have you, have you been in that situation, number one, and then what did you do? Yeah, so I, I've definitely been in that situation where I didn't have enough income to pay my bills. Um, that looks like a few things that you can do. You can always look to increase your income, right? So does that mean that you get a side job? Does that mean that you um, get some, you change, you, you translate your hobby into something that's more of a paying hobby, right? So you increase your income um, or you will try to reduce your um, expenses. 
And so that means that you might not need cable, right? Uh, you cut some of those luxury items out. You, you kind of stop shopping for clothes a little bit. Um, you give a call to your insurance company and say, hey, uh, am I able to lower my premium? You can start you know, reaching out to your, um, your creditors and say, hey, how can I lower these monthly payments? Um, it happens every day and they totally understand. And so it doesn't hurt to reach out to um, either your utility bill providers or your utility providers or your creditors to kind of say, hey, I'm not in a situation where I'm able to pay this anymore. What can I do to lower my monthly payment? Yeah, and I, I will tell you, there's a lot of people right now who have done all of that. They've looked at trying to get a side job. They've looked at reducing their expenses. They're not spending money on anything that's unnecessary and there's still not enough to take care of the bills. And so I want to just talk real with you that a lot of the things that we're going to talk about is easier to do if you have enough money to get by and it's just you know trying to catch up. But if you're truly in that situation where you don't have enough money to pay your bills, that's, that's a worst case scenario. Um, there's some resources in organizations you can call some nonprofit organizations to get some assistance, but then to also work with your creditors if the if you have taken care of all of your living expenses, but you really don't have enough to take care of your debt, then we're gonna talk about some strategies and some resources to help you get some relief to get through that. So that's just being real. Yeah, definitely. And, and so, but, but first I would tell you, no matter where you are, even if you're short, it's very important for you to track it and not just put your head in the sand because I've done that. I've put my head in the sand before and it just gets worse. <laughs> yes, it turns into a whole mountain of debt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you got to deal with it at some point. You know, dealing with it now is is relatively it's a lesser pain than dealing with it later, where it's going to be a bigger pain. But but that's some real talk. So so the one area, the third step, is really kind of defining this mountain of debt that you're in. And before we even get to a solution. Um, what I recommend for a lot of people is when you look at your income, you look at your expenses, if you're able to get by and kind of tweak it and reduce it or increase your income to get some breathing room, that's fine. But if you find that you cannot meet all of your debt obligations, given um, what's left over after you take care of your necessary living expenses, then I would say, let's define what that mountain is. Let's map it out. And, and so I, I have people create a worksheet that says, here are all of my debt obligations. Here are all of my, and I start with the minimum payment. I don't start with what they're actually paying because they might be paying more, but what is the minimum payment that has to be paid? And then what is the actual balance of the debt? And then what is the interest rate? That's the critical thing that I, I look at. And then at the very bottom, when you total it, you'll say, okay, this, total amount is the minimum amount that I need to have in my budget to at least keep current on all of my bills. This is the total amount of debt that I have. And then we can go through a calculation and define what's the cost of carrying that debt. But at least that is the amount that you put in your budget to see if you can work through. And if you have, if you are paying extra, then there's a little bit extra that's, that you can pay towards those debts. So, so there's two situations we're going to go. If you are making enough money to at least make your minimum payments, or a little bit extra, and you want to figure out how to get out of it, there's a program called, or, or a technique called snowball effect. Snowball effect or the avalanche effect. Have you heard of those two terms, Brandon? I have, yeah. I actually used the snowball effect personally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so for a lot of people, they don't know the difference. So, so the snowball effect, I, I, well, what is your preference? You like, do you like the snowball or the avalanche? I personally like the snowball effect. Uh, which is basically paying off the lowest balances first. Because I look at um, tackling debt and paying off debt as a goal. And so anytime that I can uh, get one of those small wins and scratch that debt off, for me, that makes that, that brings me all the joy in the world and gives me uh, this like burst of energy to keep moving forward. Uh, so that's why I really like the snowball effect because you can like scratch those small wins off um, of those small debt debts off quickly. And I'll tell you, look, it makes sense because it's important, it's emotional. And if you can, exactly. if you got multiple small debts out there and you can mm -hmm. knock them off, 
then that's less bills you're that's less bills that's coming your way, less mm -hmm. checks you've got to write, and emotionally it's it's it helps you see that you're making progress. Yeah. And so there's value in that. And if you follow the snowball effect and use the money that you were using towards paying off those smaller debts towards paying off the next smaller debt, then you're going to get out of debt faster. There are worksheets online that you can go to and put in your payments, your interest rate, your balances, and then put in the extra amount and only apply that extra towards the smallest balance until that's paid off. So that makes a lot of sense. But you know, I like the other one, right? Of course you do. <laughs> because the other one is, is so left brain. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That so at avalanche the end of, the day, of paying the highest yeah. interest first. Right, right. So you pay the highest interest one, you end up paying less in interest fees. You end up, so it's going to cost you less and you actually get out of debt faster. Now, sometimes it's not that much faster, but at the end of the day, it's logical, right? Yeah. And you've probably spent less money doing this, this this technique as well, yes, because you paid off the highest debt first. So yeah, I mean, if that's an option for you, go. But here's the secret. Here's the secret that nobody talks about, Brandon. It really doesn't matter. You know why? It doesn't matter. You, you, right. As long as you're paying <laughs> off your debt. <laughs> yeah. In either one, you're going to get out of debt faster. Yes. And, and so the key to this is really being patient, being disciplined, and being focused. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it goes. Yeah. Kind of my my. So how I did mine was I, I had many little debts, right? I have these little things like just growing up. I mean, just to be very honest, it was crazy stuff like a cell phone bill or a utility bill and these little bills. And so once I got into the place where I said, okay, I'm going to accept this and I need to fix it. Um, I literally went and printed off, off all of them. And I had them on this, this little thing on my wall with these clips. And as I would tackle them, because I used the snowball effect, as I, and I did them from smallest to largest, and as I would um, pay them off, I would snatch them off the wall and throw them away. It'd be like a whole ceremony for me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like you said, whatever works best for you, uh, but, you know, just do it. Just tackle it. Now, for some people, this might be the first time you heard about this. So there's links in the description of the YouTube video below for you to click on and get to worksheets. And there's also a download of some slides that we're showing you where it goes into more detail. So definitely that's key. But now going back to people who are not in a situation where they can make all of their payments, what are some, re what are some, some solutions? I know that every credit card company has a big bold link in the very beginning of the main page that says, if you have been impacted by COVID-19, click here, because there are resources available. And, and even prior to that, there are resources available if you could not make your payments. Um, the thing is, if, if you were being responsible, and let's say you were on time and making all of your payments, and you were looking for help before you, got, before you were late, these companies wouldn't share with you these, these, these hardship programs because everybody would be probably jumping in on it. And so unfortunately, these hardship programs are only going to be shared with people who are either late or, or you know, have late fees or over, over the credit limit fees. And bittersweet, you got to be in a, in, a, in a dire situation before these credit card companies will offer some hardship programs for you. Have you ever been in that kind of situation, Brandon, where you needed to take advantage of their hardship programs? I have not. Oh, my brother, my brother. <laughs> oh, hey, well, I'll be, I'll be real with you. I've been in a situation where I could not make all of my minimum payments. And I used a service that I'm gonna share with you, share with everybody at the end called uh, the Credit Consumer Counseling Service. And, and there's some strategies in that case, but what I did first before I went to them is I actually contacted every one of the credit card companies. And I did a couple of things. I asked to get my credit, my interest rates reduced. And when you first ask, they're gonna say no. And what you can do is you can call and ask, well, can I talk to your uh, accounts retention department or someone else who, can have, who has the authority to reduce interest rates? And then I actually just told them that I couldn't make the payments and what else could we work out? And so they offered some repayment programs where 
I had a, a, a significant amount that was past due and they allowed me to pay a little bit towards that. And one of the challenges though, is I wasn't able to keep all of those commitments because I had good intention of paying down the, the past due amount and then getting caught up, but I was struggling still. I was still not making enough money to make all of my other expenses. So that's why it's very important to know where your money's going, which is step number two. You've got to manage and budget so that when you're making a payment plan to catch up, you can determine if it's realistic. Exactly. You can know how to allocate the dollars that you've earned. Um, and, and, and it gives you a very realistic point of view of, of where you are financially uh, when you budget. Yeah, so, so um, we're kind of got a little bit ahead of ourselves by talking about some solutions, but I want to make sure the first three steps are very clear. Know that you can do this. Um, everybody's life goes up and down. Doesn't matter how much money people are making. Um, as a financial advisor, I, I kind of see people in the true sense. Exactly. On the outside, they may look like they're doing well, but when you look inside, they hurting, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so know that you can do this, you can get through it, you're not alone. But then it's also important for you to monitor, to plan, track, and monitor where your money goes, to really define what is your reality. Without knowing where your money goes, you can't really make a sound decision. And then mapping the mountain, kind of look at what is the mountain of debt that you're in, really work out that, scale, that schedule. And then if you can, do the snowball or the avalanche effect to get out of debt faster and just be focused, disciplined, and patient, and you'll get out of debt. But if you're truly in a, in a hard case scenario, or you want to look at other strategies, the next three steps are very critical. You've got to know your credit report and how that works. So when you find that you're coaching someone in that area, Brandon, what do you tell them when it comes to understanding their credit and really attacking it from that perspective? Yeah, so it's really about helping people understand, um, you know, first off, what a credit report is, you know, what, how credit report um, or how your credit history is important and, and what's a credit history is a record of a borrower's responsible repayment of debts. Um, a credit report is a record of the borrower's credit history from several sources, including banks, you know, credit card companies, collection agencies, and even the government. Um, and then conversely, your credit score is a result of a mathematical algorithm applied to the credit report um, and other sources of information to predict kind of further delinquency. And that score determines, um, you know, what we call in the banking industry, your credit worthiness. Yeah, yeah. And I would say everybody's worthy of credit. <laughs> Definitely, yes. But, but, Everybody is worthy of credit, yes. Yeah. Right, and, and so the way that is measured by organizations who are giving credit, um, is going to be different than let's say someone like your family who loves you exactly gonna, yeah they they may go ahead and give me the 500 man right and then some people you know your family is like you don't have that much credit worthiness with your family right <laughs> <laughs> but they know where to find me as well so exactly so so but the first thing then is to really go and find out what is on your credit report mm -hmm. so there's three major agencies equifax experian and transunion um, but there's all these different places you can go to. Your credit card company um, usually has a service that allows you to get a credit report from one of the three or all three of them. They also give you credit scores and things like that. There's places that will actually charge you for it as well. And I would yeah. say if you're having a hard time keeping up with your bills and paying your credit card bills, then the last thing you need to be doing is paying for some paying service someone. when you can get that stuff for free. And, yeah. and with COVID-19 now, uh, each one of the three reporting uh, agencies are allowing you to access your credit free, your credit report free True. every seven days. Yes. And you can also visit annualcreditreport.com um, for your credit report from there. It may not have the score, but it'll definitely have the report. Um, and then you can actually, when you get the report, you have to understand kind of what's on it. So really understanding the credit report, I, I think a lot of people can get the credit report and it's just a lot of numbers. So how do you break that down and, and help people really understand each section um, when you're reviewing that with somebody? There, so there are a few sections in your credit report. So the first one is, you know, personally identifiable inner information. And that's gonna be things like your name, your address, or your previous addresses, your social security number, your date of birth, 
and um, employment information. Um, that's not used to calculate your FICO score. Um, but with these things, you want to make sure the things to look at in this in this section is to make sure that your name is spelled correctly, right? You don't want to get mixed up with somebody else. Um, does it show your current address? Is your current address correct? Um, is it the correct social security number? You want to make sure that this is just very, very basic demographic information. You want to make sure that it's correct, right? And the next section is going to be, you know, the credit account. These are lenders reports on um, each account that you have established with them. Um, the report, um, they report the type of account. So whether it's a credit card, a revolving line of credit, an auto loan, a mortgage, et cetera, um, the date that you opened the account, your limit or your loan amount, um, the amount of your balance and your credit history, um, and also, whether or not you've made on-time payments. Accounts that are in good standing, because it'll show if you are having an account in good standing or if it's um, considered to be a negative account. But accounts in good standing mean that your payments have been on time and that you've met the terms of the agreement with your creditor. Although the report states that you are in good standing, still make sure that you know um, everything about the account, right? Um, please make sure that you validate your account numbers, the date, that it, they've been opened, the balances, as well as the payment statuses of the account. If there are any negative accounts on your um, credit report, um, make sure that all of the information is correct, right? Negative accounts will typically show where you've missed payments or you've not been making payments at all. Um, and if they have any misinformation, please make sure that you dispute those with your creditors or with the credit bureau. The third section is credit inquiries. So this is gonna be a section that kind of shows all of the um, potential creditors, the actual creditors that have looked into your credit report, that have hit your report or made a hard inquiry of your report. And so this is where you've gone and you've applied for a credit card, you've applied for a mortgage, and they've actually gone and pulled your credit report and reviewed it to determine you know, credit worthiness or to determine if you are actually able to receive um, credit from the organization. Make sure that all of the credit inquiries are accurate, right? Um, this is a, a good place for you to detect any type of identity theft, right? This is, this is where people figure it out, right? If you see some credit inquiries there that are that have not been made by you, that's a telltale sign that you may have um, some issues with identity theft or someone is actually applying for credit in your name and you definitely want to tackle those immediately. Um, there are ways for you to lock your credit report or to lock your social security number from receiving credit inquiries. Um, you can do that through the individual credit bureaus. Um, so make sure that all inquiries there have been made by you and that they are accurate. Um, and the last section is going to be your public record and your collections. And so this section kind of breaks down um, public records. So if you owe, let's just say, outstanding taxes to a municipality or a state or to the federal government, this is going to be there as well. Um, any type of collection. So these are accounts that have not been paid at all, and they're just out there as outstanding debt. Um, these are going to show up in this section as well. So with this, make sure that, of course, all information is accurate. Um, and if it is, then these are probably uh, the, the companies that you need to reach out to, to to kind of make it right with the situation. Well, Brandy, here's my thought about credit scores. And you tell me what you think about this. I think credit scores are important because it, it impacts a lot. It could affect you getting a job, the interest rate you are, you are charged on cars, on your home, and on other things, borrowing money. So that it does have an impact. But I think that we have been focused so much on, on credit score, we're forgetting that a credit score is a reflection of some other things that we've been talking about that's very important, is how well do you manage your money? Mm -hmm. Do you have enough income to pay your bills on time? And yeah. so if you have a history of not doing that, your credit score may not reflect what you would like, but if we wave a magic wand and all of a sudden gave you an 800 credit score, but you still ain't managing your money right, <laughs> That doesn't yeah, solve the problem, right? It's not. It's a it's an issue of character, definitely. 
Uh, we, I, we I wouldn't say character, man. I would say more so your credit score is a reflection of some actual events that have happened in the past. True. And yes. those events as may well not as events that have happened in the past. Yes. Pardon me? I said as well as events that have happened in the past. Yes. Yeah. And, and it may be that you have every intention to pay your bills, but things have happened to you like COVID-19 yes. or something outside of your control, which is not, a, which, which is not truly a reflection of your character. And so, so again, it goes back to where your credit score is not the holy grail. And, and, and so if you practice sound money management behaviors, if you have enough money coming in to pay all your expenses, plus go on vacations and live well, but your credit score is in the 400s or something, yeah. like, how, do you really care? It speaks to priorities, yeah. Exactly. Right. But, but I think, again, knowing your credit score and what is a good credit score is important to know. And knowing that your what's on the credit report is accurate and your credit score is not impacted by errors. And realizing that if you practice these good, sound money management behaviors, over time, your credit score will increase. There are factors that impact your FICO score. And I think it's important for people to understand that making your payments on time and the amount you owe versus the credit available are the two biggest things that impact your credit score. And, and if you affect that, then that's going to significantly improve your credit over time. The other things that have an impact are things like your, your new credit cards, your mix of credit, like do you have a student loan, a car note, a mortgage, various types of fixed and installment loans, and then your length of credit, those things are important, but they make up like, um, I would say less than half of, yes. of, the, of, the, of your credit score. So okay, knowing that is important, but, but, but again, not feeling like your credit score is a true reflection of who you are as an individual. Uh, let's just summarize real quick. What are the things that individuals can do prior to going to an agency to let's say fix or repair their credit? What are the things that are within their control that they can do to really improve their credit score? Yeah, so first off is understanding what's on the credit, right? So it's having a very good handle of what is on your credit, what have you not paid, what are you paying on time, knowing it, right? Um, I would say the second thing is, is to um, make on-time payments. Just simply paying stuff on time will help to improve your credit score. Um, and secondly, like you said, you know, not maxing out whatever credit lines, if you do have a revolving credit line, not maxing those out and not using more than 50% of the line um, are, are helpful um, to improving or uh, should I say uh, tactics to improve your credit score. Yeah, and I would say, you know, correcting anything that's wrong as well. If you see anything that's uh, incorrect on your credit score or your credit report, make sure that you go and um, dispute those items with those credit, with the credit bureaus. So dispute letters are very important. And there are agencies out there that will charge you to dispute not only erroneous things on your credit report, but also correct things. I would suggest that there are resources available that will show you how to write your own dispute letters. There's a form that's in the link, again, in the description section. But basically, the dispute letter has three sections. It's the heading information, which is your address, who you're addressing it to. There's the body that actually where you identify, hey, you're writing to dispute what? Specifically, what are you disputing that's on your credit report? And then the third part is to provide any documentation that supports what you're, what you're disputing. And I'll give you a personal example. I, had, I just got a, a letter from a collection agency about a bill that, was, that said I did not pay back in July of 2020. And I looked at that and I was thinking, man, that looks awfully so familiar to a, a explanation of benefit payment that I got where yes. I went online and I actually paid it, right? Same situation here, yes. <laughs> a medical so, bill that pops up on your credit. Exactly, so I looked at this and it says, you have 30 days to dispute this, or I guess it's gonna go into a, a bigger, it's gonna go on your credit report. Exactly. So I actually called them on the 29th day because I don't really check my mail that much and I need to. And 
I pulled up my explanation of benefits where it showed that I actually made my payment online. Mm -hmm. And I called them and told them. And then I actually went online and wrote, wrote out a letter and I attached the receipt that showed that the payment was made. And, and, and the other way you could have done that is just actually writing a letter, um, putting it with, with the attachment and then mailing it certified to the agency. But let's say if I didn't catch that and I actually hit my credit report, mm -hmm. then that whole dispute process would be going to the reporting agency and doing the same thing, saying, look, there's a bill that says that a collection bill that says I didn't make this payment, but I have a receipt showing that I did make the payment, whether it's a bank statement or actually the receipt from the payment, exactly. attaching it to the letter and mailing it to the agency, and they will they will have to verify it, but then they'll remove it if it's if it's erroneous. True. So so that process is very simple. The other process is that you can dispute correct information on your credit report. And if the credit reporting agency doesn't go through the reporting process of verification within a certain time period, that would be removed. But at some point, if they are able to verify it, then it will appear back on your credit report. And that's just a waste of time, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, as a bank officer, I'm never going to say go out and dispute any <laughs> any actual right? debt, any of your accurate debt, never dispute that. And if you owe the accurate debt and you know it's your debt, don't dispute any debt that you actually owe. But there's two other situations, though, when it comes to knowing your credit. So we talked about uh, understanding what a credit report is, understanding your credit score, um, making sure that you, rep you, you find it and you review it and make sure that it's accurate, how to dispute it. But what if you don't have credit or you really need to repair it? What, how do you advise people who are in those situations? Yeah, so we advise folks who need to establish credit and repair their credit all the time. So let's start with kind of establishing credit. So you have zero credit. And so this happens a lot. Um, I work with um, a lot of, of kind of young adults who are just kind of striking out in life and, and they've never established credit. Um, but kind of these one-off situations that happen, one was actually with my own mother. Um, you know, my mom found herself to be widowed at a, at a later age, but my dad had actually taken care of everything. All of the credit was in his name. And so she was a, a, a mature woman who had never had any credit. And so what did that look like for her? So that looked like a couple of things. That looked like um, going out and there are some creditors out there that are very lenient and who have more relaxed credit standards and who will offer credit to individuals um, who have um, not had any experience. So that's one thing is to seek those out. Um, secondly, it is to establish a secured account. And so that means that you um, open a credit card, a secured credit line with your own money, and then you spend that money. And as you spend that money, it is then reported to the credit bureaus. Um, so it, you, you put a little bit of skin in the game with your own money. However, it is reporting favorably on your behalf. And uh, third, and I always tell young people this, if you know somebody, you have to know, this is the key to this, you have to know that somebody absolutely responsible. Um, you can be added as an authorized user to their credit card. Um, so if you know somebody who has a line of credit that they manage well and they're actually responsible um, and they're willing to, they can add you as an authorized user to their line of credit and that line of credit will then be added to your credit report um, the full history of it, the full payment history of it. Um, and so that will um, help to establish your credit as well. So those are some things you can do to establish your credit. Um, if you're repairing your credit, um, it looks a little bit different. Um, repairing your credit, it's a twofold process. It looks like we said before, understanding what's on your credit report and begin to make payments uh, to, uh, you know, reduce that debt mountain but it also looks like adding new lines of credit to the mix as well. And so we'll tell people, hey, if you're repairing your credit, you may wanna go ahead and add a new line of credit or add something new, even if that is a secured credit card. Let's just say your credit score is it's very low at this point and you're not able to get an unsecured line of credit. That's okay. Invest the money into a secured line of credit and have that as a brand new line of credit that you're paying favorably, uh, that you're paying on time, 
while you are reducing the debt mountain um, on the other end. So that's what it looks like to kind of repair your credit versus establish your credit. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's going to get kind of tough if you have a jacked up credit <laughs> and, and, and you're saying, well, open up a new line of credit. It's like, who's going to trust you? Or exactly, to, yeah. Or to your point, you'll find that it's going to cost you a lot to do so. But, but you can get a secure card. Mm -hmm. And the key is not carry a balance on that card. Yeah, to not carry a balance on the card, not carry more than 50% of the balance. Another great product that a lot of banks have that not a lot of people know about is a CD secured loan. And so you're actually able to, um, you know, once you get, you, once you establish your savings, because we talked about savings very early on, like establishing the savings. So let's just say you've saved up to about a thousand dollars. You can go to a bank and say, hey, I want to open a CD secured line of credit. You will first open a CD with, let's just say, $1,000, right? And then a line of credit can be established against your CD. Not only are you um, gaining a little bit more interest from the bank with your CD, but then you're actually um, establishing a new line of credit on your credit report that's being reported favorably. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. So let's talk about a couple of things. Let's talk about knowing your options. And so again, we're going back to a situation where it's just too much. You, you don't have enough money left over at the end of the day to keep up with all of your payments. And so there's several options. There's like a consolidation loan or a debt management program or doing a settlement. So let's, let's take each one of those as an option. And let's first talk about consolidation loans. Yeah. And so what a consolidation loan, what is that, right? So I always tell people sometimes that that may not be your first choice because if you, if you have trouble paying off debt, the solution normally isn't getting more debt. More debt, exactly, yeah. However, I like this approach. <laughs> <laughs> and we offer this approach a lot. Um, so this looks like rolling, you know, some higher interest debt into a lower interest um, uh, some other type of lower interest debt vehicle, right? And so this may be if you have really high interest credit card debt, let's just say you have a home, um, you can roll this into a home equity line of credit, use that home equity, pull the equity out of your home and pay off the high interest credit cards. Um, this could also look like a balance transfer where you literally can transfer the balance of um, high interest credit card debt into a new credit card where, you know, there's some type of introductory APR, let's just say for like a year. Um, and then you can take advantage of that, let's just say 0% for so many months, right? Um, you can take advantage of that and pay it back without earning additional or accruing a different additional interest on uh, your credit cards. I like the debt consolidation. Okay. <laughs> Let's be clear about this. So, let, so, so everybody's on the same page. Let's define what a consolidation loan is. A consolidation loan is a new loan, and the sole purpose of that new loan is to pay off existing unsecured debt. Yeah. And so typically it might be unsecured loans to pay off credit cards. And like you said, credit cards at a higher interest rate, you get a, a consolidation loan at a lower interest rate, and that's cool. You also talked about you can refinance your mortgage, or get a second uh, mortgage or whatever to pay off some unsecured debt. So that's what a consolidation loan is. And I would say there's also pros and cons to that. So yeah, one of the reasons why you like, pardon me? I said, yes, definitely pros and cons to it. Okay, so one of the reasons why you like that is that um, if you get a loan with a low interest rate, you can potentially save money by paying off your credit cards that have a higher interest rate. Yes then you can also consolidate payments into one payment instead of making 10 or 15 little payments, right? Yes. So th there's some pluses to that. Yeah. Now I would tell you that that's kind of hard to find <laughs> because one of the reasons why that's hard to find is if you are in a situation where you have credit at a high interest rate, getting a consolidation loan at a lower interest rate might be a challenge, but it might be out there. Right. True. But then lenders are going to require you now to pay off the loan. So you can't just take that money and not pay off the loan. Um, and, and when you do that, it might be 
it might have a negative impact on your credit score because you're closing those accounts as well. You're closing the, the, the older accounts, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And then the other thing that's dangerous is when you take unsecured debt and then you, you pay it off using a collateralized loan, like a mortgage or a car, and if you're having trouble paying that amount off, then you're going to lose your home and your car. Yeah, definitely. So, and you're playing with your credit mix at this point because you now have very heavy on the more um, in installment loans than you do on your revolving loans as well. So, Yeah, and then here's the big one. It goes back again. So if you have a problem paying off debt, chances are the solution is not getting into more debt. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. But to your point, at the end of the day, you know, you, you still might decide to use a, a consolidation loan if, like I said, consolidating that loan is a great option if you're really overburdened with a lot of debt, credit card debt, um, but you have good, you, you have good credit so you can get a lower interest rate and you're generally responsible when it comes to money. So you're not going to get into another debt and then not have, not have trouble paying that off. So the right loan can save you significant money from a standpoint of reduced interest. It could also be a more cash flow of your monthly payments or less than your combined payments of everything else. Just remember that a consolidation loan, it's kind of, it's, it's important to make sure that you don't put yourself in a situation where you're losing something of value because you're not able to pay off that loan that you used to consolidate. Um, you still got to make the payments and avoid getting into new debt that gets you into more trouble. Yeah, a high amount of discipline comes with this process. Yeah. So, so what's unique, what's interesting about this is that when a lot of people were coming to me talking about consolidation loans, I said, well, why don't we take a look at what's called a debt management plan? Mm -hmm. So a debt management plan is a little bit different than a consolidation loan. So have you uh, talked to anybody about what that, what those are? Yeah, definitely. So with the debt management plans, um, the payments are structured, right? So your interest rates, um, they may be lower and certain fees may be waived. You'll make a monthly payment every month to cover all of your included debts in that plan. Um, your debts are typically paid in full over the course of the debt management plan. Um, your, credit, your included credit accounts will be paid, paid in full, usually around somewhere between 36 to 48 months. It depends on how long your plan is. Um, you'll save some money and reduce interest uh, fees and your credit will likely improve if you make payments on time um, and your credit um, may improve. If you make payments on time, your credit will improve by the end of the program. Um, this is also great because collection efforts should stop once accepted. Once you accept this debt management plan, um, collection calls and letters should stop. Some creditors after a certain amount of a number of payments in the debt management plan will actually consider your account is um, current. And, um, but it's not a given. Creditors don't have to accept the debt management plan. So it's kind of a negotiation almost with your creditors. Um, and another thing is you won't be able to keep charging. So it's not like you're saying, hey, I wanna pay down this credit card while you're still using the credit card. Um, some of the accounts may be closed. And um, the kind of the low end of it is you may not be able to afford it. You know, your income may not be enough to sustain your living expenses and a debt management plan because it's kind of an all encompassing plan where you're paying the debt in almost in total or in a lump sum. So I have experience with this. So this is, remember I told you I, there was a time where I couldn't make all of my payments. Mm -hmm. So I went to a consumer counseling credit agency and they looked at my situation, looked at my budget, and they said, well, hey, here's the plan I have for you. If, you know, if they, they can take some of my accounts, not all of them, but some of them, put them together in a, in, a, in a packet, allow me to make a payment that was affordable and that was within my budget. And then they allocated that payment towards paying off all of my creditors. Yeah. And those creditors, they closed my account and my credit score was noted that I was going through this program, but it wasn't as bad as, them having to close the account because I wasn't paying as agreed. It showed that I was paying them as part of this program, which was looked at favorably. And when I completed that program, they actually gave me credit at a, at a reduced interest rate 
because they saw that even though I got you know, out of control and couldn't pay it off as, as planned initially, I was responsible enough to go into this program and pay them off over a period of time. Yeah. So, so like anything else, there's pros and cons, right? So the pro on that one, the pros is that it's not a loan. So you can, you can probably get into it without having to go through a credit application credit process, True. right? And then you receive ongoing counseling and education because behaviors need to change. Um, you get, for the, for the debts that are included in the program, they reduce the interest rate. So it allows you to have more of your money go towards paying down the principal. And also they stop charging um, overdraft fee or over the credit limit fees or late fees. And if you're already behind, right? If you're behind, they may even catch you up. So you don't have to pay the, the, the catch up. They make your account current and then you, you just pay it off over time. You only make one payment instead of multiple pay payments. Uh, you, in order to get into this program, it has to fit your budget. So if you're not making enough money to meet your bills and make this payment, then the you can't get into it. Yeah. You know, we got we to gotta solve something else before we get you into this program. And the key is that if you're consistent, if you're patient, disciplined, and focused, you can get out of it, like within three years or, you know, definitely over, five, you know, within a five-year period of time. So, yeah, my experience with uh, the debt consolidation loan is, I personally had um, a few credit cards that had very high balances and I had kind of ran up the limit. Like I was, I was out there spending, man. Um, and so I needed to roll that into something um, that was a little bit more manageable. And so how I use debt consolidation is I leverage a brand new credit card. And so I looked, I applied for a new credit card that had 0% APR for like 12 months. And I rolled in that high interest credit card debt into a new credit card product. So what I did was I actually rolled in uh, that high interest credit card debt into this new credit card. Um, those accounts now showed a zero balance. And I, within that 12 months, ended up paying off um, the, um, those, those smaller credit cards in this new credit card line at the 0% APR. Um, and so over the 12 months, I wasn't actually paying those that high interest rate. I was paying no interest um, because I had rolled it into a new line of credit. Yeah, so I would say there are three conditions that make your experience a positive one. Number one is you were, you changed your, your you were responsible, right? You can make, you can make payments and not get yourself into a, a like when, when you paid off that credit card, you didn't go back and charge that credit card up. And charge the one that, yeah, <laughs> that has zero balances. No, it right, right. Really, if you, to be disciplined, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm that great. I had to literally chop, like cut the credit card up. Okay, uh, okay. You know, zero balance, there. yes. Uh, but I literally had to, to cut the credit card up to not go and spend, yes. The, the All right, but then the other two things though, is that your, your new consolidation loan had a lower interest rate than Definitely. Than your, your other one so it makes sense and then in some cases even your monthly payment might even be uh, less than your combined payments of everything else so it gives you some some additional cash flow so there's some times where consolidation loans make sense so there's some also some cons against a debt management plan so one of the cons is that in when you enter the program it actually closes accounts and that it can impact your credit score so, so that's the number one. The other thing is that not all accounts are eligible because creditors have to agree to be part of this program. And so usually secured accounts are not. So you still have some accounts that you've got to pay for that's outside of the program. Mm -hmm. and, and then this is where a lot of the nonprofit organizations that offer this will do a lot of counseling and education for free. But the way they make their money is they offer these programs as opposed to consolidation loans. So even though there's a waiver, sometimes there's a monthly processing fee that you have to pay as well. Final verdict is this. It's a good plan for those people who um, already have begun missing their payments and they have damaged credit. So it's gonna be harder for them to get a new credit card or a new consolidation loan with the lower rate. And they need structured, hands-on guidance and they need help changing their financial behaviors because there's also education along with this. And um, so that might make sense. So there's all these different options. So you've got consolidation loan, debt management program. And what do you tell people when it comes to debt settlement? So first off, I wanna uh, explain what a debt settlement is. Debt settlement is 
a settlement negotiated with the debtor, unsecured creditor. Commonly, creditors agree to forgive a large part of the debt, perhaps around maybe half or so, um, though the results can vary. When settlements are finalized, the terms are put into writing. Um, it is common that the debtor makes one lump sum payment in exchange for the creditor asking that the debt be canceled and the matter be solved. Some settlements are paid over several months. And so um, this is a tactic that I've used personally as well, uh, where you know it just kind of got out of hand and I didn't pay it over a while and I had to give them a call back and say, hey, what can you do? This is what the, I call it the what can you do type of situation, right? You call your debtor and you say, I've, I've really screwed up in the past and I really want to make this right. What can I do at this point? Um, and sometimes the debt has been sold, right? So it's been sold for less than what it is to the current debtor at this point, because debt can be sold. So let's just say your original debtor charged it off, somebody else bought it and they bought it for cents on the dollar and they don't even, they, they just have it on your credit report. You can negotiate with those folks and say, hey, uh, what can you do? And this is where they kind of come in and say, hey, you can pay X amount in exchange for a paid in full on your credit report. Oh yeah, so here's the thing, man. So there's all these different options for you and with debt settlement, you're, you're absolutely right. You ultimately are gonna be paying less than what you owe. So that's a win right there. But then it's gonna drop your credit score because it's gonna be reported and you exactly. pay less than what you owe than the pay as you agreed upon. But then the other thing is that um, collection efforts still may continue when you do debt settlements or, or while you're in negotiation. Um, and also if, if it's a significant dollar amount that's being written off, that's gonna impact your taxes because that's like you've been given free money. So your exactly. taxes may go up. Um, it's not a given because everybody doesn't have to, everybody doesn't have to work with you. No, they, <laughs> they don't. No. I mean, because you, at the end of the day, you owe the original amount. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, hey, so someone owes you 10,000. Would you take half? <laughs> Would you take half? You know, it depends. I mean, you have to look at it also from the other side of the table is that I always tell people this, imagine you're the creditor, like, you know, and you've extended yeah. somebody a loan. Um, how would you, how would you feel if somebody came to you and said, hey, can I give you half of what I actually owe you? Um, and so, you know, take that into account as well. And you got to work it out with everybody. So, Definitely. So with, with all of that being said, here, here's, here's the bottom line. So as we look at our last step, which is connecting you with resources to help you make better financial decisions. There are a ton of resources out there that are free. And then there are organizations, there are the nonprofit organizations, there's two, there's two that I, specific, I specifically recommend that are free when it comes to education and supporting and helping you, you know, create a strong financial foundation. Uh, they do charge for some of their services, but I'm gonna connect you with two national organizations and there are the FDIC and the Federal Reserve Bank have a number of different uh, financial literacy programs. And I know you talked about one of them, Brandon, earlier. Tell, tell us about the, the Federal Reserve program that's out there. So yeah, the, there are two programs out there. Uh, one is from the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. That's a wonderful program that we use to administer financial education. Um, and it's called the Money Smart Program. The Money Smart Program is a, I mean, just a phenomenal program and helping you walk through every aspect of your finances, but they really do have a great credit course um, out there on the FDIC website. Um, conversely, the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas has a wonderful program called Building Wealth that you can tap into as well. And that is also a very comprehensive program uh, that that tackles every aspect of finances, and they they also do have a really great credit course there as well. Yeah, so I'm really familiar with the with the Money Smart program. They have a yeah. podcast. Mm -hmm. The podcast has a ton of information out there for you, very similar to this, but it goes into a lot more detail. And then there's a curriculum that is either instructor led that has a, a series of PowerPoint presentations, participant guides, as well as instructor guides that are usually taught by organizations like myself. Or from or by banks yes. and then there's also a web-based program as well and all of that those links are down below in the description section and i believe the web-based program is very beneficial because not only do they have some for adults they also have some for young adults 
So for those uh, high school and young adults in college between the ages of 13 and 20, there is a module that they can take on their own that addresses how do you pick a bank account? How do you uh, identify financial goals? How do you begin to save and pay yourself first? How do you understand credit and use your, um, how do you establish credit, right? What we were talking about. Yeah. Buying a car, saving for long-term goals. And this is really important for those parents. How to pay for a roof over your head. <laughs> yeah, that's so, the main thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so I can add another, I mean, we, we also are, are, you know, we are a wealth of information as well. So whoever your banker is, go see your banker, you know? Um, come see us and we can definitely walk you through this credit process. And then in terms of Comerica, we have a Comerica Financial Education Center out there on our, on our bank website, completely free information. And that has a credit course built into it as well. It's a self-paced uh, kind of a program that you can go through to receive some really good information of how to get yourself on track or to um, kind of establish your credit or the understanding. That, link, that link's going to be below, but if they want to get to that information again how do they contact you or get get access to that information brandon yeah so you can access the information uh through uh, www.comerica.com um there's a, the financial education center there or you can just simply shoot me an email bqjones at comerica.com and um, i can definitely get you that information the last two organizations i want to connect you with are nonprofit organizations on a national scale money management international Money Management International was founded in 1958 and it's the largest full service nonprofit consumer credit counseling organization in the nation. They provide services such as credit counseling, debt management, housing counseling, student loan counseling, bankruptcy counseling, credit report review, disaster relief counseling, and financial webinars. Can you, and if you go to their website, which is moneymanagement.org, you can take a look at their blog. They have a budget guide. Um, they have success stories as well as expert solutions and a ton of resources that again are free. But I would encourage you to call them for your credit report review. That is free. You can talk to a, a, a certified credit counselor who will do a soft pull on your, on your credit and they will go through your credit report line by line and make sure that you understand specifically what is on your credit report what are those things you can dispute, how to dispute them, and what you can do to improve your credit report. So that's number one. The second organization is the National Foundation for Credit Counseling. So their, or, their website is nfcc.org, and they were founded in 1951. And they are considered the, the gold standard when it comes to financial counseling and in this particular space and sector. They are the largest and the longest serving nonprofit financial counseling organization in the United States. They provide a ton of services as well. They provide services such as emergency credit help, uh, credit card help actually. They also do debt management plans. They do credit report reviews, home ownership counseling. Uh, they also do reverse mortgage counseling, foreclosure preventative counseling and bankruptcy counseling. The kind of people that they help when, they, when you look at their website and they say, who do they serve? They serve people who are in debt. They serve first time home buyers. They serve student loan borrowers, military and veterans and small business owners and many, many more. Anybody that's, if you're making financial decisions, you can, and you wanna be improve upon that, I would say go to them and get some help. So Great those are organizations. Yeah, and you can call the 1-800 number 24 hours a day. So, so Brandon, again, we talked about a lot. If you were gonna give someone who kind of fast forward and got to the end of this, what would be your final closing comment? Um, my final closing comment is to run toward the fire, man. If you see the fire, run toward the fire and put out the fire while it's small. <laughs> Don't wait until it's a whole house on fire. Um, and this is a, from personal experience. So understand your credit, tackle it very early on, right those wrongs and move forward. Forgive yourself and move forward. Well, Brandon, I would thank you. And I would say the most, the most positive thing that we can do as a result of this is take any ideas that have percolated through our conversation and put them into action. Exactly. So I want, I want you to take a moment and get a piece of paper and say, okay, what will you do as a result of being on this program? What would you do? 
When will you do it? And who will you share this with? Do not keep this a secret. And believe it, you, believe it you're not alone. You know, both Brandon and I have shared our stories. And trust me, there are people who've been in worse situations, uh, who've been in higher positions. Yeah. And, you know, money, the amount of money you make, your job, your status, your gender, all of that stuff does not matter. We're all in the same boat together. We can all improve and make better financial decisions. Definitely. So Brandon, hey, thank you, man. I appreciate you spending your time because you'll never get this time back. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. But the dividends, I'll tell you this, the dividends of what you've done by investing in, uh, with, in, into the Empower Series community, really, and then what you do every day when you wake up, when you work with other, re, other community partners, you know, through Comerica, and what you do personally, just with your dedication of time and serving on boards, man, I appreciate what you do. You're a true model of someone who gives back and being a, a community servant. So thank you, man. Thank you. They say that our service is kind of the debt or the rent that we pay to the universe for being here. And I'm just trying not to get evicted, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just say that you're great, man, because, you know, we can all be great, like Martin Luther King says, because we can all serve. And you definitely exactly. appreciate greatness, man. So uh, God bless you. And until we meet again, uh, be empowered and inspired to thrive. Thank you. Thank you for watching our Empower Series YouTube video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Remember to hit the subscribe button below as well as the little button to be notified the next time we upload our video. Until then, stay connected with us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever your social media flavor is. Inspire the world to thrive. See you soon.